<clears throat> Good afternoon. Barely afternoon, but it's after. Uh, I'm Norbert Michel. I'm vice president and director here at the Cato Institute's uh, Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives, and I'll be moderating today's event. For those of you who are here in person, welcome to the Cato Institute. For those of you who are joining us online, thank you for tuning in. Um, and we will be having a great discussion today about David McLean's new book. It is Shareholder Capitalism, How the Pursuit of Profit Benefits All. And we are also joined by Ed Rock. David is the, I'm gonna do a short, short bio here. Um, David is the William G. Drums Professor of Finance and the Finance Area Chair at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. It's like, it's, I thought my title was long. Uh, he's an accomplished researcher in corporate finance. He's got, he's very well published. He has publications in some of the world's top journals, including Journal of Finance and uh, Journal of Financial Economics, or as people like us like to call them, JF and JFE. Uh, Ed is the Martin Lipton Professor of Law and the co-director of the Institute for Corporate Governance and Finance at New York University's Law School. Also, an accomplished researcher, Ed has over 50 publications, uh, many of which are in corporate law and corporate governance. And he's researched many, many topics under that umbrella, uh, including politics and corporate law, which makes him perfectly suited to discuss this topic. Um, and not that anyone really cares too much, but I also, me, the moderator, have a background that's at least half in corporate finance. Uh, which makes me perfectly suited to just kind of listen to what these guys have to say. That's what I'm going to do. Um, here's the plan. David is going to provide about 20, 20 minutes or so of remarks. He's the author. He goes first. Uh, Ed will then provide about 15 minutes of his own comments. Ed has some slides. David does not. Uh, and then they'll go back and forth uh, attacking each other. Not really. Uh, for about 10 minutes. Uh, and then we'll open up questions to the audience. And I'll remind then, but I'll also prompt now, preempt now, and ask that when you do ask a question, please ask your question in the form of a question. Um, and with that, I'm going to sit down and Great. please welcome <clears throat> David McLean. Thank you. So I want to thank uh, Cato Institute for putting this on. Um, thanks everyone for coming, both here and on Zoom. <clears throat> um, so a little bit of background. So why, like, why, why write a book on shareholder capitalism? So um, I, I'm a finance professor, and if you take a finance course, say an, an introductory course, or even a corporate finance course like I teach, we usually start by saying, well, the goal of the firm is to maximize shareholder value. And then that's the compass for the whole rest of the class. So then we go and develop various analytical tools. We try to see how well is the firm doing that. But always this overarching theme is, is that the goal is to maximize shareholder value. Um, what, what we don't do, though, is we don't talk about what that means for everyone else. So you know, if we're trying to maximize shareholder value, what does that mean for you know, customers, suppliers, employees? What does that mean for, for the rest of society? You know, does it contribute to improving living conditions over time? Does it make things better or worse? So we, we don't really spend much time on that, at least not enough in my opinion. Um, and that, I think, created a void, and then that void's been increasingly filled by answers that, in my opinion, are inaccurate and they mischaracterize shareholder capitalism. Also, at the same time, there's been a push for a lot of substitutes for shareholder capitalism, so things like ESG, various corporate so uh, social responsibility frameworks, um, and, and I also think a lot of those don't come as advertised. Um, and so I, I, I wrote a book to, to address all that, that's why I wrote the book. Um, and the book was written for everyone, um, so what I mean by that is you don't need a, phys a, a finance or business background to understand the book. Um, I think the issues were important to everyone, so I wanted to write a book that, that you know, anyone, regardless of their background, they could pick up the book and, and understand what the issues are. So <clears throat> I'll first offer a few comments about shareholder capitalism and why, you know, why I'm a proponent for it, and then I'll talk a little bit about you know, the various corporate social responsibility frameworks and, and what, I, what I think some of the problems are. So the case for shareholder capitalism, at least the one that I make in the book, the case for it is that it's good for non-shareholders. So the, the case for shareholder capitalism, the, the one I'm making, it's not that you know, shareholders deserve things and they're great and we need to give them all this stuff, is that, that it's actually good, good for non-shareholders. 
that if you live in a world where fruit firms are, are trying to maximize shareholder value, that that's good for everyone else, even if you'll never be a shareholder. Um, and many seem to think, so a business creates wealth, you know, for its shareholders by generating profits. And many seem to think that a profit somehow reflects the shareholder's gain at the expense of the other stakeholders, like the customers, the suppliers, and the employees. And I, I think that's, a, that's a, a real misunderstanding. So the best way to think about shareholders and the other stakeholders is that they're trading partners. They're not competitors. They're engaging in mutually beneficial trading. And what I mean by that, so we can think, so, you know, a customer will only buy a firm's product if it benefits the customer. So if I go to Starbucks, I buy a $3 cup of coffee, it must be that the value I placed on the coffee is more than $3, or I wouldn't have bought the coffee. And at the same time, Starbucks, the cost of the coffee was, was less than $3 for it, so it got to make a coffee, it made a profit. So we engage in a mutually beneficial trade, and if you think of your, your economic life, you know, all the things that you buy, all the goods and services, you know, all those transactions are like that. You enter them because it benefits you, and, and at the same time, the other side benefits. And the same is true for employees. An employee only sells the firm their labor if it benefits the employee. In fact, uh, where, where an employee chooses to work, they must be getting better than what any other firm or institution would offer them, or, or they would work somewhere else. Um, and then suppliers, that's kind of silly. Sorry about that. Uh, suppliers only sell the firms their goods and services if it benefits the supplier. Um, you know, so when supplier sells a firm its goods and service, the, the supplier makes a profit from that. So no one's forced to do anything here. Each party only trades if it benefits it, and profits reflect the shareholders' gains from all, all, all that type of trading. Um, if there's no profit, then in the end, the trading wasn't mutually beneficial. The stakeholders benefit, but not the shareholders. So I think the best way to think of a profit is it's actually just a leftover that the business owners get to keep after they made all the other stakeholders better off. So the shareholders are actually eating last in, in shareholder capitalism, even though the goal of the firm is to create shareholder value. So when we say that, when we say the goal of the firm is to create shareholder value, implicit in this is the fact that the firms must serve all the other stakeholders first. Otherwise, there is no shareholder value. So when a corporate manager goes to work <clears throat> and they're trying to <clears throat> excuse me, maximize shareholder value, they're not really thinking about their shareholders. They're thinking about <clears throat> all the other stakeholders. And then can they enter mutually beneficial transactions with each of those parties? And it's important to point out that this is you know, easier said than done. Most new businesses fail to make profits and are gone within five years. Um, another thing that comes up uh, with, with, with shareholder value that I think it's important to point out, shareholder value is inherently a long-term concept. So many of the critics of shareholder capitalism claim that it encourages short-termism, especially in publicly traded firms, and that somehow the shareholders, you know, they, they really want short-term profits at the expense of, you know, invest in investments that might create value in the long run. Um, and so the ultimate goal in shareholder capitalism is we want to maximize shareholder value. So what, is, what exactly is shareholder value? It's the value of the business minus any debt. So what's the value of the business? Well, the, the value of a business, if we say it technically, is just the present value of all its future cash flows. And cash flows are driven by profits. So if we own a business, if you're a business owner, we think, okay, we can make a profit this year, the next year, five years after that, 10 years after that, 20 years after that, you know, forever off into the future. And the present value of all those cash flows generated by those profits is the value of the business. Subtract off any debt, and, and, and that's shareholder value. So if a business owner wants to sell her business, shareholder value is what a fair selling price would be. And a good estimate of what the stock price should be in a publicly traded corporation is shareholder value divided by shares outstanding. Um, in practice, so if you value a, a firm, short-term profits are usually only a very small part of shareholder value. Long-term profits are far more important. So a good you know, uh, example of this, if we look at IPOs over the last 20 years, so these are firms that first came public, the majority are tech and biotech firms, and the majority of those were losing money. But they could still come, come public and be worth hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars. If we look at biotech firms, 95% have negative profits. The majority had no sales, but they could still raise all this capital. A salient example is Moderna. Moderna came public actually before the, the uh, COVID pandemic. Moderna was losing, when it came public, hundreds of millions of dollars, and it never sold anything, but it was worth $7 billion at shareholder value. And so why is that? It's because shareholders look to the future. They look ahead when they, when they value a business. And so you know, shareholder value, it's a, it's a long-term concept. So how does a corporate manager maximize shareholder value? Well, of course, shareholder value is the value of the business minus any debt. So we want to maximize the value of the business. And the way you do that is you make investments where the future profits exceed the cost. 
So you, you play a long game, you don't play a short game. Um, and firms regularly make investments that lower their current profits but increase shareholder value. So one, one example we could look at is Pfizer. Pfizer invested $14 billion in R&D in 2022. If Pfizer hadn't done that, it would have higher profits and, and maybe more cash on hand to pay dividends things. But that $14 billion likely made their shareholders right at that point in time richer, not poorer. Because every, everyone knows that Pfizer, when we invested the $14 billion, that's going to produce drugs in the future, and those future profits are going to be greater than the $14 billion. And that's why Pfizer can be, you know, both invest and have lower current profits, but become a more valuable business. So how do things look at the economy level if all firms are engaging in shareholder capitalism? So the overarching problem of any economy is how do we allocate scarce resources that have alternative uses? So what goods and services should we make in what quantities and what things should we not make? And what, just as importantly, what, what do we not make? And profits give us the answer. So profits reflect what a consumer is willing to pay for a good or service, less the cost. So if a firm makes a profit, it means it took resources that society places a low value on and created goods and services that society places a high value on. So when a firm makes a profit, the, the economy grows and society's better off. So when firms are governed by profit seeking, all of a society has a de facto rule that says, only use a scarce resource if you can create something that's of greater value. If you can't do that, leave the resource there and let, let somebody else use it for a better purpose. Um, so profits are a really good way to measure whether a firm creates value for society. As a thought experiment, imagine if every firm strive for losses instead of profits. So a loss is I take something of high value and I create something of low value. Right? So take something that society places a high value on, make something that society places a low value on. When you do that, actually the economy shrinks and society gets poorer. If all firms did that for a long enough period of time, we'd all be back to living in poverty. So the, the profit motive is an important one. Um, so now I want to switch gears a little bit and I want to discuss the idea that firms should also pursue various social responsibility objectives. And so the critics of shareholder capitalism, they want, to, they want the pursuit of social responsibility, some type of social responsibility, if not the goal, at least as a goal. So instead of a firm just trying to create shareholder value and generate profits, it needs to have these other kind of social, you know, social or environmental goals in mind that should govern its behavior and that it should adhere to and might even become before profit or, you know. Uh, so um, how, how, how should we think all about that? Um, and I wanna say that I think this, this umbrella kind of includes all the monikers like ESG, you know, sustainability rating, stakeholder capitalism. I, th I think they all have this common theme that you shouldn't just be creating shareholder value, you need to have these other things in mind. So how, how do we think about them? So one problem right up front is if we say, okay, a firm needs to have a greater social responsibility, well, who gets to decide what's socially responsible, right? Who gets, who gets to be that? Whoever gets to do that has a lot of power, but who, who gets to be that person? Um, people can have very different views on what constitutes sound social and environmental policies. That's why we have elections after all, and our elections are hotly contested, right? Um, so society did not issue an ESG rating. Uh, what ESG ratings reflect are the views of the institutions and the persons working at the institutions that issued the ratings. And I'm not saying their views are good or bad, but they're certainly, you know, they're ideological and, and they reflect what, the pers what, what those particular people think. And maybe we agree with the ideas, but maybe we don't, but it's, it's not something objective. Um, so labels, like, is something socially responsible and ratings on things like ESG and sustainability, what they really reflect is what the labelers like or dislike. It reflects their preference. It doesn't reflect society's preferences. And so in practice, corporate social responsibility tends to promote more progressive causes, causes that progressives favor. And I, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm not making the case for or against those causes. I'm just saying they're not, they're not really objective and nonpartisan. They're quite subjective and partisan, and they reflect a, a particular point of view. So we, we mislabel them a little bit when we say they're socially responsible. Is this something that everybody in society agrees on is true? And in reality, it's not true. There's a lot of disagreement over that. Um, and so when corporations pursue these policies, they force their shareholders to contribute them, and many of their shareholders uh, disagree with them and may have been voted against them. Um, Another common thing I'd, I'd like to push back on a little bit is that ESG and these other frameworks, I hear this a lot in academia, they're promoted as a, as a, as a, as a correction for, for a regulatory failure. So the idea is that, well, businesses, you know, when they operate, they say create, you know, negative externalities like something like pollution. And, you know, the traditional way to solve that is we have some, and, and that harms people. And let's say society says we don't, you know, we want less of this, so we pass a regulation and we fix it. 
And so what some in academia say is, well, there's probably these externalities out there, and for some reason, don't know why, they're, they're not being regulated, but ESG can be a de facto regulation. So even though the government's failing to regulate, now this, you know, an ESG rating or a sustainability rating, it can take the place of the regulator and fix this for us. Um, I would argue, uh, in, in contrast, that if something isn't regulated, it's probably because most people don't want it to be. So you know, I, I may think something should be regulated, but the fact it isn't doesn't mean there's a regulatory failure. It just might mean I think a bit differently than everyone else does. So I think it's more likely that, that's what's going on. So currently, if you search through the US federal code, there's over a million restrictions in the federal code, over a million rules and restrictions. So we're, we're quite good at, at, at regulating things when we think it needs to be regulated. Uh, the EPA alone, in its, in its code, has over 100, 170,000 rules and restrictions. And the EPA adds an additional, excuse me, an, an additional uh, 3,000 rules and restrictions every year since it was founded in the 1970s on average. Um, the New York Times uh, did an article and it asked, how, how, many, how many rules and restrictions are there in the federal code that an apple orchard has to, has to follow? And of course, no one could know that because no one could read the federal code. So with the help of a computer algorithm, they did a word search through the federal code to figure out how many rules and restrictions applied to apple orchards, and they came up with 12,000. Um, if you operate in the state of California, California has 400,000 of its own rules and restrictions in its regulatory codes. So it's not as if we can't regulate things when people want them regulated. So a question is, why do we need these additional corporate so social responsibility rules and regulations? You know, regulations can have benefits. So I'm, not, I'm not making the case against regulation, but they also have costs. So we need to decide which ones we like, and we need to decide do the benefits exceed the cost. Um, and government regu regulations, you know, whether we agree with them or not, at least ultimately they come from elected officials. Um, no one elected, you know, people who are e issuing ESG ratings or people who promote these types of things like Klaus Schwab or Larry Fink, no one elected them to anything. Um, but instead they're trying to kind of issue these de facto regulations. Um, I think the Paris Accord, so a, a good example of this, um, I think the Paris Accord and what's going on with some, with, with some asset managers, I'll talk about this a little bit, I think is a great example of trying to force a de facto regulation on the public that it doesn't want in the name of being socially responsible. And so what the Paris Accord does is it calls for net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. And currently that's not a law or binding regulation on any US firm. There's no, there's no rule that says US firms have to have net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. And you know, many, and I think the reason for that, so there's many surveys showing people are, are not willing to spend a lot to combat global warming. Maybe they're wrong, but that's how people feel. Um, and they don't view it as a big threat, at least at this point in time. Uh, now, getting to net zero 20, by year 2050, uh, if you read the research on it, actually has huge cost. I read quite a bit about it in the book. And I would argue that the, the best research on this, if you compare the cost of getting to net zero 2050 versus the cost of unmade, unmitigated global warming, the cost of getting to net zero are, are much, much higher, like many orders of magnitude higher. It's, it's probably not even close. Um, and so for that reason, that's probably why people don't want that as a policy. Yeah, what we have is, is fund managers, such as like, like uh, uh, BlackRock, State Street, Fidelity, working in concert with the United Nations and some help from the World Economic Forum. They're trying to get firms to force, they're trying to force corporations to comply with the Paris Accord. So even though it's not a real regulation, they're trying to tell, tell corporations, well, you need to comply with it anyway. They're trying to make a de facto regulation. And uh, what I would say is like, if, if voters want that Paris Accord, if voters, if we all decide, we the people, that we want net zero 2050, regardless of what the research says, regardless of my own opinion, if that's what people want and it becomes a regulation, then fine, that, that, that's how our system works. But what we shouldn't have is something that most people don't want, that, that is very expensive, kind of being forced on us, uh, you know, via, uh, asset managers kind of working in, in concert with, uh, with the UN in the name of sustainability or responsibility or, or things like that. So in, in the end, the way I would summarize all this, the corporate social responsibility, the ESG, these other things, it's really an attempt to give the people who issue the labels and the ratings an outside say in how corporate assets are used and in how society is regulated. And this comes at the expense of everyone else. Um, if Klaus Schwab and Larry Fink have a, have a greater say, that means everyone else gets a lesser say. And so, in the end here, I'll, I'll leave us with one last thought. It's how, how do you, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, best measure whether a business creates value for society? And so, um, 
Profits reflect wealth creation for, sh for shareholders earned by mutually beneficial trading with customers, suppliers, and employees, right? So shareholders, customers, and employees are, are all members of society. So if you have a profitable business, the shareholders are making money. Uh, other people are, are engaging in, in mutual beneficial trading with it. That's how money's getting made. So there's a lot of wealth being created and people are being made better off. And a wealthy society is a society f uh, full of businesses engaged in this type of mutually beneficial trading. Without this trading, we, we all live in poverty. If you, if, you wanna, if you wanna ask why are rich countries rich and poor countries poor, it can be many reasons, but one, th one thing you'll see in wealthy countries is there's lots of this business going on with mutually beneficial trading, and in poor countries, you'll see an absence of that. So I would argue that this type of trading best reflects whether business uh, creates social value, uh, much better than an ESG rating or, or something like that. Um, and shareholder capitalism encourages more of this type of mutually beneficial trading that can benefit everyone, and, and that's why I'm in favor of it. So yeah, that's all I have, since thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. And now we will have some comments from Ed. Uh, if you could put my slides up. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Cato, for, for having me. Uh, thank you, David, for writing this, this terrific book. Uh, I commend it to everybody. It, it, uh, it's a wonderful articulation of what I view as the mainstream Milton Friedman defense for shareholder capitalism. And the core is one that is completely consistent with the founding principles of the Cato Institute. The core is a moral defense of capitalism. It's a voluntary exchange, leaves both sides better off. Uh, that plus property rights equals capitalism. And the success of capitalism is why we're rich. Um, incredibly important to defend this set of propositions. One question I had in reading the book is, who is the audience? And David said a bit about this. I took the audience to be my children, who are all college, post-college age, uh, and came out of college with a set of fairly standard left-of-center views. Um, and that the goal of the book is, in the best sense, to indoctrinate a new generation into the virtues of capitalism, a system that they've all benefited from as they've, been, as they've grown up. The question, and I think it's an interesting question, which is how best to, com to do that? What is the most effective way of conveying the benefits of capitalism? Uh, one way is, and, and in personal experience it was very effective, is uh, to have your children uh, own shares. Uh, when my son was 13, we took some money that he was given and bought shares of Microsoft. And overnight, he went from being indifferent to the future of Microsoft, this was at a time when the government was investigating Microsoft, to being a strong defender of Microsoft against any government scrutiny whatsoever. It had almost too great an ideological effect. Uh, and it seems to me that that, as one thinks about how to, to defend the system, providing people with a stake in the system is a pretty good way to shift the way that they think about it. And indeed, if you go back to the 1980s, the whole justification for tax benefits for employee stock ownership plans was to turn employees into capitalists, to turn employees into investors with the, the effect on their views that might come from that. I'm not sure it worked particularly well, but it was, it was, it's, it's, I think, something worth returning to as we think about how to convey this set of, of lessons. So how well does shareholder capitalism do in defending, in defending uh, the system? And for this, I, I, I want to take two thought experiments, because I think the, the test is not against the, the dumb undergraduate, but against the smart progressive undergraduate. Uh, and so imagine a bright undergraduate. Will this, will this convince him or her uh, that his or her best versions of the progressive critique are wrong. And the second, because they come in for a lot of 
uh, of criticism of the book is, is the perspective of Marty Lipton or Klaus Schwab or the Business Roundtable, who in David's view are all stakeholderists of some sort. So I want to I think about three counter arguments in this, in this regard. One is the externalities problem. The second is the problem of politics and regulation. And the third is the issue of, uh, of short-termism, which David has, has focused a lot of attention on in the book. To start with, let me just put my finger on an ambiguity in the very phrase shareholder capitalism. And we'll, we'll come back to this in the course of my remarks. One view is that this has to do with the goals of corporate governance, pursuing the benefit of shareholders versus other stakeholders. But there's a second which goes to the means of corporate governance. Are the means of corporate governance, uh, is this goal best achieved by increasing shareholder power versus managers or restricting shareholder powers versus manager. And the shareholder-stakeholder uh, vector is one vector. The shareholder-manager vector is another vector. And the two of them is where corporate governance today is, is located. OK, so what's the traditional defense that David does such a great job of articulating? Corporate governance, shareholder capitalism, capitalism of any sort isn't self-justifying. The justification has to be that ultimately it promotes general welfare. And this is what David means when he talks about the benefit not just to shareholders, but to non-shareholders. And in the classic shareholder defense, the manager's duty is to promote the value, uh, the interests of shareholders by maximizing firm value, that externalities are the job of government that sets boundary conditions, boundary conditions by regulation, and that shareholders in that system are best understood as the owners and managers as their agents engaging in what I think of as a constrained optimization, constrained optimization task, namely maximizing the value of the firm within the limit set by regulation. And the link to general welfare is Adam Smith. It's that the invisible hand of the market, individual firms pursuing their private interests, promote the general welfare. The problem is, and this is the bright undergraduate point, the problem is, are externalities well controlled by regulation? And the bright undergraduate might say, no, because massive corporate political contributions and lobbying interferes with, with the legislative branches and the regulatory branches controlling regulation and leads to legislative deadlock. And the bright undergraduate would point to, <clears throat> years ago point to tobacco, now will point to carbon and point to the absence of a carbon tax despite strong evidence that climate change is a significant, significant problem for everybody. Now, how do you respond to that? I don't want to get into the debate. David has a series of responses to this uh, that leave me thinking it's plausible. It's plausible that there are some externalities, and I think of carbon as a good example, that are not well controlled by regulation. And then a second set of arguments that I think are also quite interesting, which is that whatever one thinks about the optimal regulation of carbon or the implementation of a carbon tax, one can be quite skeptical whether shareholder or corporate-driven mitigation is likely to succeed. And how does the, re the undergraduate respond to this? And here, I think it's actually a genuinely interesting debate. Because take the issue of a carbon tax. For years, for years, the major oil companies put huge resources into lobbying against a carbon tax. And then the ESG forces, if you will, started putting pressure on the publicly traded oil companies to take the social cost of carbon into account in their, in their capital allocation decisions. And so we had engine number one at ExxonMobil. We've had pressure on Shell. We've had pressure on Chevron. 
What's so interesting is that a few years ago, the American Petroleum Institute, the lobbying organization of the petroleum industry, changed its views and now supports a carbon tax. Now, how did that happen? One account is they didn't mean it, that they knew it wasn't going to happen, and so it was politically, it was politically useful to say it. But another is that one story I've heard is that the, the major oil companies threatened to leave the API, accusing them of being in the pocket of the independents, and essentially saying, we, the majors, because of shareholder pressure, this shareholder-driven climate activism, we, the, the majors, have to take the social cost of carbon into account in our CapEx decisions. And we want our competitors, the independents, to have to suffer from that same, same restriction. In other words, and this is the argument that I think the bright undergraduate would make, is that shareholder-driven climate activism, while not directly a good way to create regulation or de facto regulation, might change the politics. Very interesting, a very interesting set of concerns. Let me turn now to, to stakeholderism, which gets so much attention in the book, and offer a limited shareholderist defense of stakeholders. Uh, and here the targets in the book are, are Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum, which is currently meeting in Davos, and so we get daily reports. Marty Lipton from Wachtell Lipton, who is the most distinguished defender of corporate management, and the Business Roundtable, the organization of, of CEOs of major corporations, which in 2019 issued its famous statement, which David and others take as an embrace of stakeholderism. Let me start by a sort of cynical view, which is how plausible is it that these pillars of the business community are actually anti-capitalist? Might something else be going on here? If you take a look at the Business Roundtable statement issued by this, these CEOs in 2019, what they say is that while each of, the individual, each of our individual companies serves its own corporate purpose, we owe a fundamental commitment to all our stakeholders. We commit to deliver value to our customers, invest in our employees, deal fairly and ethically with our suppliers, support the communities in which we work, and uh, generating long-term value for our shareholders. And then they say, and this is the part that is taken as the stakeholder claim, each of our stakeholders is essential. What they don't go on to say is, our shareholders are more essential than anybody else, or we're all doing it for our shareholders. How to understand that? One way is to view that as a stakeholderist manifesto. Another is to view it as almost a banal statement of how a manager builds value in a corporation. And this, I think, is how the CEOs view it. They said, look, in our business, the way we build value is first we have to have a product that our customers want to buy. And second, if we don't have a good set of employees, a trained, well-trained set of loyal employees, we're not going to be able to produce that product. And if we don't deal fairly and ethically with our, our suppliers, then we're not going to have a business that thrives. Uh, and similarly, we have to invest in our communities because otherwise our business can't thrive. And if we do all of those things, if we do all of those things, we build a great business which benefits our shareholders. And as a matter of management, that's a great way to bring together all the factors of production to work together, which is the job, of course, of corporate management. As a management strategy to spend all your time saying to your employees, your customers, your suppliers, that really all you're about is maximizing shareholder value is a lousy way to get everybody to work together. It's not that they don't care about shareholder value. They obviously do. But that's, that's an argument that you want to treat your stakeholders well because that's how you build shareholder value. It's a, it is a stakeholder, it's an instrumental view of stakeholderism. Now, 
Is that a good or a bad approach? Well, this particular approach is something that Milton Friedman, in his, in his great essay in the New York Times Magazine years ago, found particularly offensive. And in one of the great sections in, 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 the, in the essay, he rags on, on corporate managers who he thinks are just trying to pander to public, public uh, demand and in doing so is undermining the legitimacy, <clears throat> the social and political legitimacy of capitalism. And he may be right. That I think is a very strong critique of mouthing sort of uh, platitudes uh, that seem to give credit to anti-shareholderist forces. Let me turn now for a few minutes on this problem of short-termism. It's something we've heard a huge amount. It's something that David spends a fair amount of time in the book focusing on uh, and rejecting as a problem with shareholder capitalism, <clears throat> at least as he defines it, maybe not rejecting it as a problem with what we now see in the marketplace. Uh, the short-term fallacy, he says, is based on a false claim that shareholder capitalism encourages managers to focus on short-term profits at the expense of long-term growth. Let me provide a brief way of thinking about short-termism that a, a way of thinking about short-termism that is consistent with everything that David teaches in his basic finance, corporate finance course. Imagine you have two types of shareholders in your market. You have the short-termists, think of activist hedge funds. Uh, and you have long-term shareholders, think of index funds who are invested forever. Assume further that the short-term shareholders uh, are very influential with the long-term shareholders and with managers and will work to replace managers who cross them. And assume further that there are two types of projects that managers can invest in. There's project A with a net present value of 100 and minimal asymmetry of information. It's really easy to communicate this. Think leverage recap. Think stock buyback. Easy for an outsider to, uh, to, to analyze. The second is a complex long-term project, developing a new pharmaceutical intervention, developing a new high-tech product. Very long-term, very expensive, but with a net present value of $200, but lots of, of opacity. In a world in which the short-term shareholders have a lot of influence, Managers, rather than crossing the short-term shareholders, will systematically, the short-termists say, systematically adopt Project A rather than, uh, rather than Project B. Um, and the effect of that is a reduction in long-term shareholder value. That's the model of short-termism that I think Marty Lipton's worried about. That's the model of short-termism that we should all be worried about, is whether the possibility that short-term oriented shareholders can interfere with what David teaches his students is the goal of corporate finance, which is to maximize long-term share values. Uh, and that's a problem, and that's a problem that raises not the shareholder-stakeholder issue. That's a problem that raises the shareholder-manager issue because on the, the, the managerialists, Marty Lipton, Klaus Schwab, the Business Roundtable, uh, for them, the problem is short-term shareholder interests interfere with building great companies and that instead more discretion should be given to managers to manage, which requires a set of policy interventions in their view. Um, the, in particular, insulation from market pressures. And so for the managerialists, things like staggered boards, things like dual class capital structures, 
Things like stewardship codes for long-term investors like index funds. Things like the new paradigm that Marty Lipton and Klaus <coughs> Schwab and the, new, and, and the World Economic <coughs> Forum developed. All of these things, from one perspective, look like stakeholderist innovations. But from their perspective are managerialist interventions. They are interventions through paying attention to stakeholders designed to insulate managers from short-term pressures so that they can make the highest net present value investments over the long term that David correctly teaches his students is what shareholder capitalism is really about. Now, that creates a set of accountability problems. You insulate managers from shareholder pressure, and you worry that they're going to pursue their private interests, their personal interests, rather than the interests of the firm. That's the big, one of the big traditional uh, controversies in corporate governance. Can one correct for that, control those agency costs through things like independent boards of directors, compensation contracts that align the interests of managers and shareholders, social sanctions, reputational sanctions, sufficiently so that the insulation that you provide the managers to invest in the long term can occur, or do you need the shareholders to play a much more focused uh, disciplinary role through proxy contests or hostile tender offers? And I hope in the second edition of the book, after this book, after this edition sells out, that David addresses some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, would you like to pick up right there, maybe? Or, uh, I know there's not a, there, we don't have a, a really wide disagreement here, I think. Um, there's some subtle issues in that, but I, would you like to go right there? Talking particularly about the second, uh, the, the follow up. Second. The, your, your, the book that you've <coughs> now committed to write. The book that, okay. That's fine. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so first, I think that's a, <coughs> excuse me. Um, no, it's a great and thoughtful discussion. Um, as you say, too, and Ed was kind enough even to send me his slides four days before he came down. So ah. I said, thanks, you know, thanks for that. And I think there's a lot of very good points in there. Um, we can, maybe we can debate, debate one point a little bit. Because actually, a lot of it, I kind of, um, I, I don't necessarily d disagree with a lot of it. I mean, maybe one thing maybe is a point of clarification. Um, so the, the profit motive that I, that I guess I talked, I talked more about the profit motive and why profit is good, and that's linked to creating value, really it, it, that would apply to all businesses, I think. So um, a lot of this, we're talking about publicly traded corporations, but you know, th this would also apply to private corporations or even law firms and LOCs. And so it, we use the word shareholder because I think as Ed points out, a lot of the more interesting governance problems happen in publicly traded corporations. Um, but so I guess we can talk about, about the short-termism example where a firm has a valuable project and it, and it skips it because it's concerned about maybe short-term stock price movements. So I, I would say, first of all, I, I would actually think shareholder, the way I would interpret shareholder capitalism is the firm should, should do the more valuable project. That, that, that's, a, that, that's how I would interpret it. Um, so I, like, I, I don't necessarily think, at least or especially when we teach it, that a, a private firm should have a different set of rules than necessarily a public firm. Although Ed is right, public firms have these other things to deal with. But I, I think, like, in theory, how shareholder capitalism should work is really exactly like Ed says, and I guess even like, like Marty Lipton says, is that firms should, should do the, 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 the most valuable project. So I think the issue is, so, and that really would maximize shareholder value. And I'm thinking of shareholder value is, so we've correctly, correctly valued the business. And what Ed's pointing out is, well, maybe in the short run, the stock price isn't quite aligning with that. And I guess my, so my, my overall response would be is, is, is really, Okay, so if, if we allow for the fact that, that a stock price could maybe be too high or too low, and among finance professors, there's maybe some debate on that, but let's just have that assumption. I would still say the corporate manager's job isn't to game that. Um, especially, you know, we say with shareholder capitalism, there shouldn't be any deception. So I would argue in this example, the, the fund manager, the, the, the corporate manager should invest in the second more complicated project, and maybe it's not fully reflected in the stock price yet, and then they should tell the hedge fund, well, good, now you can buy more of our shares because they're undervalued and tell your other hedge funds, you know, it's friends to buy them and, and, and should just, you know, they should honestly communicate what they've done and, and, and why that's valuable and important. Um, 
And I, I want to talk, though, a little bit empirically about the idea is how, how likely is it that investors undervalue investment and they don't, and they, and they, and they don't put a, you know, a, a proper value on that, like they want short-term profits. And so I, I would say that it's actually the opposite. I would say investors tend to overvalue exciting investment that they don't understand that well and, and not undervalue it. So as an example, I'll start with the, let's start with the, the, you know, the, the biotech firms that come public, right? So these biotech firms come public, last 20 years, 95% of them had no profit. Most of them didn't have a finished product. Remember, Moderna came public with, with no sales yet, neg losing 100 millions of dollars, but people gave it a market cap of 7 billion. Did people really understand everything that, that, that Moderna was doing? Um, let's think about the tech bubble, you know, the NASDAQ tech bubble. So what, what, what was that about? That was about you know, firms that aren't making any money, but investors getting too excited about, about, about their potential. I mean, more generally, there's a, a, a literature in finance, and I work on this, which is um, predicting the cross-section of stock returns. We sort stocks on different variables and try to predict returns. The firms that have the low returns tend to be the firms that invest a lot. So in investment and also raising capital are, are pretty powerful predictors of returns. So it's the firms that are investing a lot, the firms that are issuing lots of shares, and even the firms that have grown very fast in the past. Looks like investors get too excited about these, the prices are too high and then they end up having disappointing earnings relative to what analysts say in, in low returns. Um, so, I, so I would say empirically, so yeah, I'm sure in some places short-termism could be a problem, but I, at least from what I've seen, I think empirically it, it, it goes the other way. And actually there's even academic papers in finance uh, showing that managers uh, cater to these beliefs. So let's say you have a firm that doesn't have a lot of growth ahead of it, but investors think it does, so it has a very high price, that firm will invest more than it should just to cater to those beliefs and keep the price high. Um, and I think that's also wrong too. I think that's also a violation of shareholder capitalism because you're, you're deceiving people here rather than creating value. Um, so I guess that would be, yeah. So I don't know if that one's good. Yeah, sure. So a couple of comments. Yep. Um, I think I agree with everything you say. Uh, one is to just point out that the way you use the phrase and the theory of shareholder capitalism, it's a normative standard. It's a standard that we aspire to that we should hope firms aspire to, and many of them may, as you said, for a variety of reasons, fall short. That there may be many firms owned by shareholders that don't follow the dictates of shareholder capitalism for one reason or another, and part of what's interesting is figuring out why, what gets in the way of that. The, the, the difficulty on short-termism is to the extent that what I described takes place, that there are foregone higher net present value projects. You can't observe them. So empirically, there's no way to measure the magnitude of that effect. It's a perfectly plausible effect. Some people have the view that corporate managers forego higher net present values projects a lot. Others think very little. Very hard to know what the right answer to that is because you can look, for instance, at IPOs, as you suggest, and it's, but it's entirely possible that the IPO market works differently than capital markets with respect to mature companies. That there could well be overvaluation of companies in the initial public offering for a whole set of reasons having to do with hopes and dreams and, and, and various other things. At the same time, as with respect to mature companies, this problem exists. You have different sorts of players. In the IPO context, you've got the key players are the venture capitalists, the entrepreneurs, and the buyers in IPOs, which are primarily institutional investors. In the mature companies, you've got hedge fund activists who are different types of people than the venture capitalists. You've got, again, institutional investors. Uh, and now you've got corporate managers who don't have the same stake in their companies that the founders have in, in venture capital driven uh, startups. So it's entirely possible that both effects take place. I don't have a view as to the magnitude because I don't know how to measure it. I don't know how to measure the, the cost of foregone projects that can't be observed. Uh, but it worries me. This idea that there's a shadow effect of hedge fund activism that interferes with shareholder capitalism, it seems to me, is a policy issue that we ought to think about. 
So do you think that's uh, an, at the core an ownership issue, um, agency problem by itself, separate from just an ownership issue of property rights? You know, if it's uh, if I'm owning shares, that's one thing. If the institutional investor is owning shares on my behalf, mm -hmm. is that another thing? Is that is that a way to address that, or is that what do you what do you think? So I don't think so. I have no stake in whether we call shareholders owners or not. I, there's has some political resonance, but functionally it's not the issue. The issue is, is how do you structure a corporate governance system to achieve shareholder capitalism? And that I think is the interesting corporate governance question. Um, and that's really complicated because you have two problems. One is you want to encourage net present value maximizing investments. On the other hand, you have to have a mechanism for correcting errors. And you have to think about those two things together. I think wh when I teach this stuff, I view activist hedge funds like Tryon or Elliott or uh, Value Act or Third Point, I view them as a scarce social resource. There are very few investment funds that can reliably <coughs> identify undervalued companies and fix them. And in large cap companies, there's fewer than 10. It's a really hard business. Lots of people lose money at it. Now, the way their current system, which I think works pretty well, is that the, the activist hedge funds identify undervalued companies, come up with a plan for fixing them, and figure out whether it's possible to implement it depending on the shareholder base. If there's a controlling shareholder, you can. In the current market, the decision makers ultimately are the corporate stewardship groups at the large institutional investors, because they own upwards of 20, 25% of, of the stock, and that means they're going to be collectively the, 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 the determining voter. We're in a system where the, the, the first thing that happens is the hedge funds go to the company and say, we think you're badly managed. This is what we think you should do. Sometimes they reach an agreement, sometimes they don't. Lurking in the background is the ability to launch a proxy contest and take the question to the institutional investors. We have 10 or 15 of those a year that actually get to a vote. On those 10 or 15, I can't think of anybody in the capital markets who is better positioned to decide between the hedge fund strategy, between Nelson Peltz's strategy at Tryon, and Procter & Gamble's strategy than the large institutional investors. They've got stake in the game, maybe not a great stake, but they have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. They've got expertise because they have these stewardship groups. I think as to those 10 or 15, we get it about right. Where I worry is there are another 200 out there where they buy positions. And the advisors come in to the board and say, you know, Tryon's really scary or Elliot's really scary and, uh, and you should do what they say. And then there are another 400 where the advisors go around and say, you see what happened to those guys? You want to prevent that. You don't want to be a target of hedge fund activists, and we know what hedge funds look for. They look for the ability to do these cheap short-term things like pay a big dividend or whatever. You should preempt them. You should preempt them. You should, do, you should think like a hedge fund activist so you won't be the target of a hedge fund activist. And that shadow effect is what I worry about. Because that's, I think, a very plausible scenario that will lead corporate managers not to invest in the opaque but highest net present value projects. Yeah, actually, can, can I address a yeah, different, yeah, yeah I, I don't disagree. Yeah, I think, I think these are good points. Um, talk about the, the uh, stakeholder, <clears throat> um, so, some of the, like the verbiage with business round table and, and I guess why I, um, why I have some concerns with that. So in shareholder, <clears throat> if we talk about shareholder capitalism, so what's the corporate manager's job? <clears throat> excuse me, we're trying to maximize shareholder value, and we can only do this by engaging in mutually beneficial trading with the stakeholders. So the stakeholders are really important. But at the end of the day, the corporate manager works for the, is, is supposed to be working on behalf of the shareholders, so they, they don't really have a license to, you know, if, if, if a particular transaction with a stakeholder doesn't also benefit the shareholders, we don't do it. The trading needs to be mutually beneficial. So like if we have a private business and someone hires an employee, just an, an individual business owner, you know, the employee is free to quit. If the job benefits them, great, they can continue to do it. If the job doesn't benefit them, the employee can quit. And the business owner has the same thing. The employee creates value for the business owner, 
But if that ceases, the business owner doesn't have to keep, keep hiring the employee. Um, a corporate manager, therefore, should just be in a publicly traded corporation, just really a substitute for the, for the, for the private business owner. So in a publicly traded company, we have millions of shareholders all, all over the place. We can't possibly manage the business, so we hire the corporate manager to do that for us. And so, yes, they want to engage in, in trading with, with all the stakeholders, but it has to be mutually beneficial. That's their job to make sure of that. When we start saying, well, it, the, job, the role isn't to maximize shareholder value, we're just trying to do things for all the stakeholders, suddenly the corporate manager can do whatever they want. <clears throat> so now they can enter arrangements with the stakeholders and maybe they're not mutually beneficial, or maybe they have some cause they like and we can just call that cause a stakeholder and we can give money to that cause. But it really, so under shareholder capitalism, there's kind of this strict rule that you only spend and invest if it, if you, if it conceivably could benefit the, the shareholders and create value for the business. And when you start just saying, well, I work for all the stakeholders, it, it kind of takes all of that away. It's almost as if uh, the, the corporate manager becomes a referee and, and just they're all the stakeholders and people don't want, want different things and I'm deciding who deserves what based on, on you know, whatever kind of model they're using. Whereas in shareholder capitalism, it's a, it's a bit more explicit that you're, you're an employee and you have a particular role. And yes, you care about your stakeholders, but, but to the extent that it, you have to, it has to be a mutual benefit. You have to be creating value for both groups. So like, if that's what the business roundtable and Klaus Schwab really mean, I think just, just be honest and say that. So let me, um, let me, but, let me yeah. press you on that. So, okay. so as I interpret what they're doing, yeah. they're worried about regulation. They're okay. worried that that in the wake of the financial crisis, where employees feel like they didn't get a fair shake, that mm -hmm. appeals like my former Penn colleague Elizabeth Warren's Accountable Capitalism Act or, Mar or Marco Rubio's equivalent sort of thing or Bernie mm -hmm. Sanders' uh, version of it, that they're worried that that has some political, uh, political purchase. Mm -hmm. And that their view, and they're very sophisticated political actors, their view is that embracing principles of stakeholderism is the private sector way of preventing intrusive regulation. Now, you can argue that that's not true. Mm -hmm. Fair argument. But let's assume they're right. Let's assume that this is a compromise necessary to prevent intrusive regulation that will, in fact, have a substantial effect on long-term share value by, for instance, mandating 40% of the board seats being held by employee representatives. If that's what they're doing, do you object to it? Uh, I, so somewhat, because I think you could, still, you could just explain creating shareholder value are, already requires this type of stakeholderism. I, I don't know why you just can't explain it to them honestly. Yeah, I guess I get uncomfortable with things where there has to be some, some, some deception in it. I don't know. I, I, it, it seems like it's not excessively complicated, so why can't we just explain to everyone that, you know, w when you're pursuing shareholder value, you're also doing good things for these. And, the, argu people. and yeah. the argument they would make, I think yeah. they have made, is that, yeah. you know, in a populist, in a populist moment, mm. that doesn't work. It doesn't work. And mm. so trimming your sales a bit is, yeah. is a good, because, you know, you look at, Davos, right? Yeah. It's not like it's filled with these these socialists, right? <laughs> it's the it's the watering hole of, of the of the economic elites, and they embrace this, I think, yeah. as a way of warding off regulation. Now, I I don't know I don't I'm uncomfortable with it for precisely Milton Friedman's reasons, which is I think it gives away much too much. It, yeah. it concedes too much to the critique. And, and I'll know, and right before we go to uh, questions to the audience, I'll, I'll, I'll throw in here on something that I do know a little bit about. Uh, you could talk to the banking industry right now, and you know they kind of did that years ago. Uh, and right now, they're not too happy. Um, so you might, you, know, you, you might get a lot more than you wish for if you go that route. Uh, and you might not stave it off as much as you just get buried under it. Um, maybe 20, 30 years later, and somebody comes out and says, you know what, we're going to raise capital requirements. <laughs> and, you know, you, but you've already made that deal. You know, you've already accepted something thinking that you wouldn't get too much of it. And maybe you don't right there, but you're probably not going to like that decision further on, you know, further down the road. Uh, anyway, had to throw that one in. Um, so we will we will go we'll go to our Q and A period. Um, remind people who are the online audience. Uh, 
Uh, if you're following this, you can submit questions directly on the event webpage, Facebook, or YouTube, or X, using hashtag Cato Books. Um, and then for anybody here, please do speak clearly, and I will again remind people, please ask your question in the form of a question. Just let's go here. Well, we have two in the front. It's either one. Let's go there. To what extent is this short-term problem self-curing? That a lot of the uh, people on the street will simply buy uh, S&P 500 index fund, which takes care of itself, and a little few will say, oh, we want things with more risk and go for the things that the hedge funds are pushing. So uh, from the small proportion that is so short term, is that really a problem? So I'm the one who believes in short term. Is a, I'm not sure it's a problem. One, one robust solution is private equity. Is, is taking companies that are not thriving in the public markets because of shareholder pressure and taking them private uh, with, managed, with, with owners who both understand the projects and have, have strong incentives to maximize firm value. The problem with that is more distributional than anything else because lots of people are not getting the benefit of the profits and private equity, but they would if we could solve the problem in public companies. And so pension long-term investors in index funds uh, don't benefit from, lose out if, if companies go private because they're not equally exposed. But I think in terms of the e ec economy-wide problem of short-termism, I think it does self-correct. I'm going to go back here and then we'll come back to the front. I, I have to relate to you a real-world experience that punctuates the theories you've been describing. The 1980s, I'm director of investor relations for a New York Stock Exchange traded company. It's the height of the shareholder revolution, which is really pushing back against management doing whatever it felt like. And uh, our largest shareholder calls me up to New York to meet with them. They're angry about the amount of money we're donating charitable contributions. And uh, give me this tongue lashing about how this is wasting money that should be. And by the way, for those of you who weren't around in the 1980s, his way of describing it is if you keep that money, then the chairman's wife decides who all the charities are going to be, all of her friends. If you give it to me, then my wife decides where, what I'm going to do with it. So I want my wife to give the money away, not the chairman's, not the CEO's wife. I have to go back to report to him on all of our charitable contributions. But the interesting thing is, and it's the theory in practice, is the argument I created or expo used was uh, th 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 this donation makes this group happy so they don't come after us. This donation makes this senator happy so he doesn't come after us. This donation makes this group happy so they praise us. And he said, oh, so you're, this is a protection racket and you're paying off bribes to, to maximize the profits. I said, I would never use language like that. He said, we're done, I don't care, you, you know, you're fine. They never questioned us again. My question is, the theory works well in everything except the consumer markets, because anybody who has experience with the consumer markets, that these are not real quarter percentages, but a quarter of consumers buy on emotion, take no, have no idea what they're buying. A quarter of them um, are, are incapable uh, intellectually of, of making logical, rational decisions. Um, another quarter of them um, basically kind of do what they're told. So the whole theory breaks down in in so the, the consumer market. Is, so that's my question. How do you deal with the consumer market, which doesn't function on the terms of th theoretical economics? Thanks. How do you function with the consumer market that doesn't? Do you mean re well, retail traders? <clears throat> you mean retail trading or, or firms selling products to people? It, it re re retail uh, purchases. Of, of shares of stock? No. No, of just people buying things. Buying things. Consumer product yeah. companies. Consumer product company. Um, 
I, so your, your, your thesis is that when people buy things, they, they don't. So I guess, I guess I'm operating under the assumption that each of us in our economic lives, when we go out and purchase things, um, we expect that the value of we get is more than the price of what we pay on average. Yeah. Sometimes I might buy something and regret it later, but on average, when I trade with a business, that trade benefits me or I wouldn't keep doing it. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I guess, I, guess so I don't assume that there's the smart people and the dumb right people. Here. I kind of assume we can all make these decisions. So first of all, thank you for writing this book. Uh, I say that because I wish you had written it in 2020. Yeah. In 2020, I was the lead author at the World Economic Forum for the Stakeholder Capitalism Public Program. So I definitely, I am recovering from that. Uh, I used to work there, and now I work for Mike, who I think uh, did the forward to your book. Uh, so oh, okay. that's my experience in terms of this, uh, being that young, impressionable uh, student who didn't really know what he was getting into. Uh, the, the main question I have now is about pricing mechanisms. So mainly pricing mechanisms, I think a lot of people are pricing in, um, in long-term externalities. But usually a cliff needs to happen in order for change to happen. I'm thinking of Boeing example, right? The stock will get pummeled for not investing in R&D, et cetera. And that, that's kind of the narrative in the media right now. So what I'm wondering is, number one, you know, what needs to change for a, price, like a pricing mechanism? Or what piece of policy needs to change where we can have a better, more efficient way for management to deal with long-term externalities that a lot of ESG investors say, you know, our ESG ratings are our warning signals for 10, 20, 30 years out the line. What do you think we need to do uh, in that sense right now? What, what do you think isn't being priced? long-term externalities that many ESG investors seem to be so worried about that are somewhat up in the air and not really tangible, but how would you deal with that now? So price like within the, within the firm stock price, or you mean like, you're, so like the firm should account for that when it's like... Pricing externalities. So an ESG company who gets a bad score now, who has a high carbon emission, yeah. they will have a lower score. And they said, you know, you haven't adequately priced in the effects of climate change onto your supply chain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so they hurt it with still, this secondary rating. Yeah. So how Pricing's how not a good that, word, but I maybe think, rating. I think, thank you. Yeah. So I think how to price that's kind of a bit debatable. So I would say there's a new special issue in climate change economics, and it's actually dedicated to looking at the cost-benefit analysis of, of, of the Paris Accord, right, getting into net zero 2050. And I might be forgetting the numbers. There's a paper in there by Richard Toll. I think he's the world's highly cited, uh, most highly cited kind of climate change economist. And he does a meta-analysis where he takes, 60, I think, 61 estimates from 39 different studies and says, what's the effect of climate change on the economy by the year 2050? His estimate from the 39 uh, studies is half a percent of GDP. By the year 2100, he gets to about 3%. That 3% number, you can find this in many places. The total cost of climate change in the economy between now, at, at year 2100, is probably between 2 and 3%. When, when we looked at, the, so then the, the, the people who are talking about all the externalities and like the, we need to get to net zero. So in, in the same issue, there's a team of MIT re researchers and they estimate what would it cost us to get to net zero by year 2050? So they think it's 16% of GDP, as opposed to tolls half a percent. And then by the year 2100, it's 10% uh, of GDP, as opposed to 3%. So the first thing is, I, I think that people need to get a real handle on what that actually, what, 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 what the effect of climate change might actually be. Um, and so what I say is that with the, the ESG people and the other people pushing for net zero, so, and I think Ed said this too. So ideally, like, so if we, we can look at a 2018 paper on this by, by William Nordhaus, the optimal policy would be probably a climate tax, um, a carbon tax that starts very low and increases over time. That's not what people are proposing. People are proposing like you can't, you can't we, we're gonna go to net zero completely by year 2050. And it looks like that policy is much worse than, so you have the optimal policy to do nothing and then the net zero policy. And the net zero policy, it, it looks like the do nothing is much closer to optimal than net zero, and I'd say according to kind of good researchers. So, so the first thing is, is that when you ask people about how, the, how big the externalities are, I'm not sure we, we, we actually kind of know that. Um, and, and, I, and, and, I, and, and I would say, I, I think the ESG crowd's assuming much bigger numbers than what I think some of the latest research shows. And we can debate over what the research shows. But I think that's the problem with climate change, is people don't really agree over, over, over how big a problem it is. 
So I, I, I favor, um, you know, I, I don't want to say like I'm in favor of regulation because sometimes I, I don't like regulations, but, but in the, well, I, let me add, let me say one other thing with the, with the climate change things. What the climate change research also shows is that if, if in the U.S. and Europe you take a very aggressive CO2 mitigation strategy like net zero 2050, but the rest of the world doesn't do it, you end up with the same climate because China, India, developing world increasingly, you know, create more of the CO2 emission. So it really doesn't matter what, what you're, so this whole thing like it's priced and, you know, what we do in Europe and the US, if everyone continues on as is, at least according to the models that I've seen, it doesn't really, really matter that much. Um, so this all, it, it all sounds like very, it, it, I think it's a bit ideological and I don't think people talk very confidently like we need to price the externality and they're being very confident like they know these are, there is an externality and what the price is. And I'm very skeptical of that. And I, I, I've taken the time to read the better research on that, and I'm not sure it, I don't think it really matches up with, with, with what they say. So it's, well, yeah. Let me just follow up on that yeah. answer. I think there, there are different perspectives. One is a firm-specific perspective, a second is a portfolio perspective, and the third is, is a, a social perspective. <clears throat> if you're a property casualty insurance company writing homeowner's insurance in Florida or California, Shareholder capitalism tells you you need to take the effects of climate change into account in deciding whether you're going to, to continue to write policies, and if so, what you're going to charge. That, I think, is utterly uncontroversial. That's a real effect of climate change on investment strategy. It's a real effect of climate change on firm management. But it's completely within the standard model because, obviously, if your homeowner insurance policy if you're writing homeowner insurance policy in places where there seems to be an effect of climate change, you have, to, you have to price it in. That's one way to price it in. A second set of arguments has to do with if you're a portfolio investor like BlackRock or Vanguard or State Street and you hold the, hold the whole market, does it make sense, for instance, to lean on Exxon, Mobil, or Chevron to reduce their carbon emissions, not because that's good for Exxon or for Chevron stock price. Let's assume that it, it reduces the stock price by 20%. You might nonetheless, some people have argued, think that's a good thing because from a portfolio perspective, it's net positive for you because the effect of the carbon emitted by Chevron or Exxon affects all your other portfolio companies. And there's a set of people who, what goes under the name of systemic stewardship, who say we should be doing that. There's a third level that says, okay, regardless of what's happening to individual companies, we're not talking about, there, there's, there's a difference between fire insurance and preventing fires. And that if the world is in fact on fire because of, of carbon emissions, we have to figure out a way to solve that. Those are three separate debates, three separate issues. The first, it strikes me, is utterly uncontroversial and everybody's going to do it. The second is, in corporate law terms, very controversial because corporate law is primarily focused on maximizing single firm of, of producing uh, companies that are wealthy and not taking into account an investor's other kinds of investments. And at the social level, it seems to me it's above my pay grade because it really has nothing to do with corporate law or corporate governance. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, we're going to... We're, we're really getting close now. We're going to just end. Sorry, Bert. Sorry. We're going to, I'm just going to end with uh, what I think is a good wrap-up question that we got online. And it is basically this. Um, what, if anything, is the biggest obstacle to shareholder capitalism today? What, if anything, is the biggest capital? Biggest, biggest uh, obstacle. I would say education. Yeah, I would say education. I think, I think it's misrepresented. I think it's mischaracterized, uh, not just in universities, but maybe in the way it's somewhat reported on. So I think if it was, it, and that's kind of why I, was, I wanted to write the book, because I thought, here's something that should be well better understood. It's, I think, important for humanity, and I think it's being mischaracterized. And so I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think education and knowledge. Um, and, and I also say, too, like if someone were to read my book, let's say they, at the beginning they don't agree with the book and they re read it, and in the end they still don't agree with the book, but they understand the arguments better, I think that's a win. Mm 
So I, I think so yeah. a better understanding of what it means. Yeah, just better understanding of the issues. And even if, if we don't all end up thinking the way I think, well, fine. But I think a better understanding of the issues is, is important. Yep. OK. Ed, do you want to? So I, I think we live in a world of shareholder capitalism to a first approximation. There are lots of frictions. But to a first approximation, we live in a world of shareholder capitalism. Uh, there is a question of of defending the legitimacy of that system. And I think the solution to that is for everybody to read David's book. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Yeah, yeah thanks a lot.